Good afternoon. Um, for those of you I've not met before, I'm Barry Salzman. And I have to say, I've not filled tech talk like this in the year I've been at Google. So note to self, Mario, you are invited to every one of our media and platforms, all hands meetings from here on forward. So I first met um, Mario in 2001. And at the time, a reservation at Babo was the toughest reservation to get in New York City. At the time, I think he had three restaurants, is that right? And had published two books. 10 years later, Babo is still the toughest ticket in town, which in and of itself is no small feat in a city known for fickle foodies. But in addition, um, Mario has, I think, 15 restaurants today. I'm getting the thumbs up. 15 restaurants today, published eight books, um, television shows, Vineyard, um, Charitable Foundation, and the latest addition to, I think the latest addition, unless I'm out of date, to the Mario Batali empire has been the Android app. And that's what he's here to talk about today. Um, as a tribute to Mario, I think everybody knows that um, our chefs at Hemispheres are doing a set of Mario Batali inspired dishes for lunch. So after this, be sure to head up there and join us for lunch. I just want to read you something from Mario's official bio. And it says, at the root of Mario's success is his passion and respect for all of the great tastes and traditions of Italian cooking, combined with an insatiable desire to experience and experiment. This magical combination of passion, education, and chutzpah is on display every night at his extremely popular restaurants and evident in his books and TV shows. Well, last night I watched Mario's last appearance at Google on YouTube. And I want to say that, Mario, you have broken a Google record. He was on record as being the outside speaker to have used the F word more than anybody else in a 45-minute presentation. So I'm certain he's not going to disappoint this time. Mario, I have to say, it is effing good to have you back. Please join me in welcoming Chef Mario Batali. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm sure you'll be slightly disappointed that with a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old, I've changed my rating from R to PG. So I only say fuck when it's really essential. <laughs> Which sometimes is and sometimes isn't. I'm here today in support of the launch of the Android app that uh, I have. It is, if you've ever watched the old Food Network's show called Molto Mario, which is on now on the cooking channel, I think at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> Maybe it's 4.42, just to challenge you. No, I think it's like 7.30 or 8. Uh, what it is is a straightforward, very direct, demonstration of what really good Italian technique, how simple it is, how, how, how much it's based on shopping. And as opposed to a lot of the other apps, which are virtually cookbooks translated to the page, this I actually walk through each of the dishes just as if I'm in the kitchen with you. And the idea is to empower you to feel that you can actually watch it. There's a thousand features which we're going to demo in a few minutes that describe and display how you can use it in the very complicated world of multitasking how we can use all of the tricks and treatments to make it happen. But what it's really fundamentally about is understanding that people, in addition to wanting to go out to be entertained by food, that what they really want to do is understand their food, they want to love their food, and they want to know about their food. 30 years ago, you became a cook, not a chef, uh, right after you got out of the military and some time before you went to jail. And that's because cooking at that time was the lowest common denominator job. Anybody could peel a potato. Anybody could start in a kitchen and effectively work in a diner in any town or in the military or in prison cooking food. Our fascination with food came as a result of our fascination with our health, our understanding of our health, our fascination with the things that give us pleasure. And I must say I'm quite pleased to say that Whereas 30 years ago, you might go out to get a bite and then go to the game, or go to the opera and then get a bite, or 
go to a concert or a museum and get something to eat on the way. At this point now, amongst many of the people in this room, the bite is actually the central part of our evening or our afternoon. And it's our obsession and our pride and our understanding, as well as our internationalization and our super suave bola way that we travel around the world and look for things that make us happy, that food has come to the center of the plate, as it were. Subsequent to that, of course, cooks became a little bit more successful. And it's in no short, it, it's not to short it, but I think that although cooks have enjoyed a certain little bit of fame, eventually the next rock stars aren't going to be cooks. It's going to be farmers and fishermen. Because eventually you'll realize that no matter how much technique there is and how many bams there is or how many squirt bottles there is or all of those other things, effectively what really is the biggest decisions you're going to make are going to be on what you buy and how you source it and where you get it. So there's also shopping parts in this app, but I think the real understanding is to make something delicious, you really have to buy something that has a point of view. And it's that kind of slow food mentality, that kind of searching for biodiversity, that is what I really try to represent at this point. I don't know if any of you have heard about this little grocery store I opened up called Italy on 23rd Street. But if you walk in there, there's a, there's a, there's a, a huge component of it is slogans. It's allowing people to understand that it's one little bite of information that will allow you to really get your hands on what a great tangerine is or why you eat this kind of spaghetti or what kind of oil this is. And it's not really about Italian food. It's about the micro-regional components of Italian food and American ingredients as well cooked into that world that make it so satisfying to do and so delicious and also nutritious for you. So this app has all of that rolled into it. And what it really is about is empowering you to understand that you can cook just like I can, almost as good as some of the great grandmothers from Italy. And that's the objective behind this, is to remove a little bit more of the veil, to look a little bit behind the curtain, but effectively watch and learn how to cook the kind of things that I do, as well as use it just for entertainment. I mean, it's just kind of fun to watch someone who seems to know what they're doing, doing what they do pretty good. And that's why I'm here to do it. Now, I'm going to introduce Matt Bardeen, who's my partner in this, who understands all the technology of it. Basically, I stood up in front of a camera for about five days, and we shot 85 videos, which is a good little clip. And we had a good time. So Matt, why don't you show us about how to use this Android app? OK. So let's see. this is uh, the home screen of the app. Actually, maybe we'll start with, now oh, that's good. And um, the main feature navigationally is this. Hold on, let me interrupt one second. If there is any questions at all time, it can be, we can just go right ahead and say, or app, bring up what you want. If you see something that looks incongruous, or you just want to say that you love Led Zeppelin, I mean, just bring it on. <laughs> so the na main navigation feature is this dial, which is inspired by a stove dial. Uh, and basically, we give the users a lot of ways to navigate and drill down uh, and look at the recipes. So you can go by region, by course, by season, things kids love, because Mario's into kids. Um, you can bookmark your favorites. <laughs> Mario has kids, is what he meant to say. I have kids. I like their friends. We hang out. I'm not so into kids. No, I, I'm childish, is what he meant to say. I'm childish. That's what he meant to say. And he hasn't used the F word once yet. Not yet. So just, just a fucking introduction. So let's look by, by category and uh, let's look at the pastas. And uh, oh, I didn't bring my glasses up, so I don't know what this That's is. That's Bucatini alla Matriciana, man. Right on. One of my personal favorites. Um, so if you look at it this way, you can scroll through and just quickly look at all the steps. You can also hit the, um, not the back button, whoops. You can also hit the menu button. And this uh, custom design navigation bar lets you see the ingredients, which you can also move to your uh, shopping cart. It lets you see all the videos that would relate to this particular app. And uh, I mean, meaning I'm sorry, that this as recipe. you use an olive oil, if you want to understand a little bit more about olive oil, right then and there, you stop. You put a little bookmark and say, all right, let me find out a little bit more about olive oil, maybe before I use it or before I purchase it. 
So then you go to that, and then if in the middle of that, for some reason, you want to understand a little bit about how to zest a lemon, you can go right back to that and say, all right, now let me show you, let me see how to zest a lemon, and then go back to the recipe, and then continue through. And, and since you mentioned going back, this uh, tab right here is for bookmarks, and as soon as I touch that, it's automatically bookmarking this recipe. So that's how I jump around and can cook several things at once. Um, so now if I want to cook this recipe, I would turn it this way in landscape mode. And this gives me the steps either in text form or in images. So I can scroll through and just look at all the images. A lot of chefs are visual people and they can kind of look at this and get a sense of what they want to do. But then it also gives you the text and you can toggle back and forth. Um, this one doesn't, oh, there's a timer. If Mario calls for a timer, we've built them into the app. And um, So say simmer 10 minutes, for example, or cook pasta. Oops, was there a timer here? There it is. There you go. So if I tap this bar, there's my timer. And I set it, and it's now running uh, behind all of these. It's good, right? Perfect. Nice, huh? Bravo, Matt. <laughs> Um, now, if at that same time you went to another recipe of a salad that you were making to serve with this, and there was a timer on that, you could run concurrent timers going at the same time. It will also warn you when your spaghetti should be coming out of the water in case you're busy on the phone or liking kids or whatever else you do. <laughs> Which Mario is known to do, apparently. Um, so just in terms of Mario mentioned the other kinds of videos, they're not just recipes in this app, they're also... Um, Two other kinds of videos, they're Kitchen Basics, which, uh, do you want to talk about that a little, Mario? Sure. Uh, I'll describe how and what you should look for when you're buying, or what you should be aware of. We'll talk about different kinds of salumi, what salumi is, where you can buy it, what the good ones are, what the ones that aren't so good are. I generally don't talk poorly about anything, but if I find something I find that I don't like, I'll mention a way to avoid it. And that's just about going to the right stores. Um. Like if you want to know about salt, I talk, I talk about salt for like four minutes. If, that's just the kind of guy I am. I think the understanding, however, that really, in addition to, your, to the ingredients that you use and that you buy specifically for that dish, the, the most often drive-by victim is the things that you use in your pantry that you haven't evaluated. If you're using a subpar oil or a subpar salt or a subpar kind of tomato or a subpar kind of anchovy, everything that you use that in, or even breadcrumbs, if you use them improperly or you buy them wrong, the building blocks, the fundamental starting, the foundation of your dish is already marred. So you're not going to be able to stand much of a chance of making it great. The point is not necessarily following only what I say. It's about developing your own culinary point of view. And the informational text and, and the informational videos in here kind of coerce you to become more involved in understanding your pantry, which is really how you're going to make much better food. And having three different kinds of salt, because you know what they're for, and, and using their different levels of salinity and their texture, will affect the final composition of the dish, as well as the pleasure it's going to give to your friends and yourself. And understanding those details is what making really good food's all about. And it's not complicated, especially if someone describes it to you. Maybe reading it, it's not so obvious. But when you're sitting there looking at it, and I'm pointing out the things and what to look for, that empowers you to become a better cook, I hope. So let's just go back to um, let's go back to that recipe, and I'll just show Three, you guys two the minutes video. and twenty three seconds. Get your sauce going, Matt. Oops. Okay. Um, let's turn it back this way, and now you can watch the video. Uh, you can watch the video. There we go. Speak <laughs> now. I want you to speak now. Okay. Don't talk. Shh. Close that. I don't know what that is doing. Here we go. Can you guys hear this? Anyway, that's the video. <laughs> Bucatini, uh, alla matriciana. That means Bucatini in the style of the women from Amatrice. It's spaghetti with a hole. What I have here is guanciale. If you couldn't find some guanciale, <laughs> you would go buy some pancetta or some great American bacon. I just give it a little chop right here with one of these fancy knives. <laughs> I point to my name on my sweatshirt, and then I show you that even with the hands that used to be the Jimmy Dean pure pork sausage hand models, you can actually still make good food. 
The beauty of this is using these cameras, we use these Canon 5 cameras that are so beautiful that you get in there and you can really get a good sense of it. I use, always use extra virgin olive oil. <laughs> and blah, 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 and it goes on. And it's just like a segment from one of the old shows that I've used to do and that I'm going to be doing again where I fundamentally show people how to do it step by step, watching it there. I'm really in the kitchen with you, which is what makes it fun, and it also makes it something that you can really use. It's almost as good as a Kid Rock video, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> right. Any other details? Uh, I think that's a good start. Right. Good. All right. Barry, why don't you come up? Let's talk a little bit. Matt will keep going through that and show us other details. Here's the shopping list. Oh, the shopping list is really cool because what will happen by the end of next spring is you can create a shopping list and then you can push a button and it will go to Italy and they will send it to you. So you're sitting around pretending you're working. Yeah, I'm calling someone really important. And you're basically shopping for tonight's meal. Italy will deliver that to your house before you get home. That's technology working for us, my friends. There's, the timer just the went timer off. timer going off. Take the pasta out. Take the pasta out of the pan. I would love to sit next to you, but I have to stand. So uh, no problem. <laughs> on your computer, well, no. I know that it, I know they can get it on one of your competitors' smaller format programs. <laughs> I've seen that one. Have you guys got a G-pad yet? <laughs> I'll bet it's coming, though, and it will immediately be on that. So I'm not going to sit and have the kind of conversation I would like, because I'm not Mike, so I'm going to stand at the, at the podium. Um, but I wanted to maybe kick it off with sort of a broader question, and then we'll come back to the app, Android specifically. Um, but Mario, the, the broader question is one that you and I were talking a little about yesterday. Um, and if I look at the arc of your career, to the 10 years, the, the last 10 years, and the incredible um, increase uh, that you've had over the last 10 years, it's paralleled very much um, a broader interest in food, right? It's the, the, the interest in, um, in food, the farm to table movement, um, nutrition, a lot of these, uh, this, the making of chefs as celebrity, this has really been a phenomenon that has increased um, exponentially over the last 10 years. Why? What do you think has driven that change in how we think about food? Well, I think food became uh, a significant part of people understanding that not only should they exercise, but they should eat well. I think that information became much more diffuse with the rise of the Food Network and then subsequently with the rise of social media and technology. I think that it's now very much part of the game to share information very quickly as it comes out, as you hear about something, and the way that we do it now, it used to be that we wrote letters, and then we used the phone, and then we used the handheld phone, and now we can virtually send any piece of media, any long, short document, any piece of video, from cell phone to cell phone, from handheld to handheld, in seconds. So the, the, the information gets out, it's much more widely read, it's much more widely appreciated, and the sophistication of the people that are reading what used to be a Betty Crocker recipe are now much more fascinated in the idea of not only regional Italian cooking, but they understand the difference between the, co the cooking of Puglia and the cooking of a town in Puglia called Bari. And then when you want to talk about what really makes Bari interesting is the kind of fish that they use there or the kind of sweet peppers they use in their fish stew. And suddenly there's a whole level of sophistication that travel around. And as we will all realize very quickly in the next 10 years, when all content will become free, then we're going to really see how that kind of information goes out. And it's going to be much more tied to how you create the relationships between the content provider and the content user that's going to make the really big difference. And the advertisers and the book companies and sadly, the record companies who missed the entire boat are all starting to really pay attention to how this information is getting out. And that's, that's the real next 10-year generation ideology, is how we're going to monetize something, but how also we're going to take credit for our own ideas in a world where it's shared so quickly that it's everyone's idea at the same time, which is good. This is good. Don't get me wrong. It's not a, not a bad thing. Um, in the meantime, anyone who has questions from the audience, if you want to make your way to, to the mics, it looks like we've got another part of the demo, but feel free to make your way to, to the mics. Um, just as a, as a follow-up to that, Mario, so 
the internet being a big catalyst of this trend or this phenomenon because of access to information, what it also seems that it's done is create the opportunity for individuals to become celebrities and to create brand ar around themselves. Prior to the digital media um, momentum, the real brands were those that were owned by very large companies that had the resource to get the exposure and, and the publicity. Um, how do you relate your success in building the Mario Batali brand to digital media? Which tools have been more powerful for you? Where do you feel like you've had better traction and what has been not as effective as you might have expected? Um, that's a good question. I, I would say that being part, just being, just being present in the revolution helps a lot. I certainly wasn't the first uh, person on, on uh, YouTube, but a lot of the things that I do are now well represented on there. And the beginning of that was letting people who might not have ever watched your show or ever cared about Food Network or ever cared about Italian food, suddenly there's a compelling reason to take a look at one little bite of it. And that introductory level is what causes people to take it viral, if you, if you would like to say that. And the idea of being able to use that as a as not, no, not so much as a marketing tool, but as a communication tool to allow the message, provided you have one. A lot of people don't have a message and they're all over the internet and all over YouTube. And that's all right too. I mean, it's kind of funny to watch the cat like chase the alligator for a minute, you know? But you know, at the end of the day, whatever. I, I think information and content is what's gonna drive that. And, and if you have that, it's much easier now to meet people that might not have ever heard of you. There's a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk, the wine guy, who started out with this weird little thing in New Jersey and now he's you know, now he sells like $10 million worth of wine in a matter of three years. He's taken it from a, 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 a standard iPhone camera or whatever camera that you use and, and, and broadcast himself into a position with the Wall Street Journal where he's like the, the wine guy now for young people. And it's interesting to see how he's managed that. And it's because his content is unique. It's because he's funny and because he knows what he's talking about. And all of the rest is all of the rest of it is tools that we need to learn how to use or we can disregard and figure out later on. I'm new to the world of tweets, Twitters, and twats, as it were. I'm not sure how you, <laughs> I'm not sure the past participle, but uh, I guess tweeted, I I'm sorry. Um, I'm new to this world and I enjoy it because I, it's not like I say, I'm going to get a pedicure. I, I, I manage it in a way that it seems at least more interesting to me and a few more people than just I see a lot of people just saying, yeah, I went and I had a tuna sandwich. Well, that's really great. Why did you waste my time telling me that? But if I say, all right, I went and I understood how they cured this tuna and I made something interesting out of it and I watched it, and there's a whole level of information, then this new social media has traction because it has something more for someone to get their hands into. If it's just, uh, I mean, we have a party on Thursday, you're all welcome to come, is a great use of it because you might reach people that you want to come that you never would have had access to. But just saying what you're doing, I got a haircut on Thursdays, like, yeah, right, good. <laughs> I see you put some other content up. Did you want to talk I about just, that? You were talking about Puglia, and uh, I just wanted to show another feature of the app is to drill down into the recipes by regions. Stretching um, out eastward toward Greece and Byzantium. Oh, whoops. So here's the map of Italy, and I got Puglia wrong. Sorry, Mario. First I put up Lazio or something else. Um, but here's Puglia, and so here's information about the region and then the recipes that are on this app right now that are from Puglia. Which is pretty cool, because <laughs> that's original content. That means that's not in the book. What that is is you get something that's unique to that, and that's what, that's what kind of drives an app sale for me. A lot of the apps are, you know, like, I mean, I like the, I like the Google app that you can talk into the phone. Just, that's probably the one I use the most, because I can say, all right, where the hell is Harry Cipriani right now? And that finds it for me. But other informational ones, like there's this one by a guy named Ruhlman called Ratio, which for me is the greatest cooking app of all time. If, if you have a fundamental understanding of how to cook and you go on Ratio and it says sausage, it says this how much of meat, this how much of fat, and this how much of spice as a, as a ratio. And if you want to make a pound of sausage, it tells you what to do. Same thing with a biscuit batter or a cake mix or a, like a hundred things. You go in there and you say, all right, I want to know how to make this. And you kind of know how to make a roux-based gravy, like a Thanksgiving gravy. How much roux do you need for a gallon of stock? And it shows you how to... A lot. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not worried. Just so you know, that's what an aneurysm sounds like. <laughs> so if you have one of those in a private, quiet room, go to your doctor. 
But the idea of the information exchange is what it's all about. And that's what makes this app kind of distinct. I'm really cooking there with you. It gives you all the information that you might have ever thought about while you're on the show. And that's kind of interesting. Yes. Hi, Chef Batali. Thanks for coming. Um, so I actually have a reservation at Lupa with some Googlers tonight. Beautiful. And I'm wondering what should we order? <laughs> that's an excellent question. <laughs> have you been there before? No, it's actually my first time. OK. Um, the best way to understand an Italian meal is to get some antipasti to split up, then get one pasta per two or three people and split them, and then everyone get an entree. So that at least everyone gets one thing that they guaranteed they like. <laughs> but you taste other things. Like there's this crazy calf's tongue in a slightly briny pickle with sliced onions in it that's called lingua samistrata that is so good, but so many people wouldn't order it because they won't want to commit to that appetizer for themselves. So you get like four or five appetizers for five people or six people. <laughs> then you split a bunch of pastas, then you all get your main course. If you've never had the uh, cacio e pepe, which is a, a sheep's milk cheese and black pepper pasta condiment. We do it as better than almost any other place in, in, um, in America. And it's the most classic peasant dish of all Roman trattoria. It is not a fancy dish. It's not a ristorante dish. But it is so good when you taste it that you'll die. You won't die, actually. You'll be happy <laughs> and live longer. I'm going for happy. Thank there you. There you go. All right, so this is not a shy crowd. You're not going to make me sit here and read out questions from the Dory, I, I hope. So, and um, you don't even have to go to the mic if you just want to yell it. Like, I, I can hear. <laughs> there are recipes in the app, by the way. Yes. So, um, hi, my name's Phoebe. Thanks for hi, Phoebe. coming again. Um, I had the chance to do an internship at a goat farm. And one of the things I learned while I was there is that it's very challenging to get a foothold in New York City when you're a small supplier. Um, so I'm curious, how do, you, how do your restaurants make their decisions about which suppliers to go with, and how long-term are your relationships with your suppliers typically? Good question. Um, the, the easiest way to impress one of the purchasers, and the purchasers in our restaurants are always the chefs. We don't have, like, purchasers. We don't have that big of an organization. You bring in a sample. You make sure you get an appointment. You talk to the head chef or a sous chef. You let them taste the product. And if it's great, we'll buy it. We love the idea of local. We love the idea of, of things that represent the Italian ideology. When you talk about ricotta, like the hardest thing for us to do often is get sheep or goat milk ricotta because it's inconsistent, because the animals give up milk when they're ready. And if, if you don't do a lot of the animal husbandry and you can keep your herd in the came, same kind of growth pattern that you need to to make this, a year-round supply of cheese, if you're out of it for three weeks, you kind of fade off our radar, and we need to find out a way that we can get it almost regularly. That said, we'll still run specials with products that maybe come intermittently, like, listen, it's only in the spring that we get ramps. So we run ramps in our menu for five, six weeks, and then they're gone, which to me is a very beautiful thing, because that causes us in America, who can buy strawberries on Christmas Eve, it, it, it allows us to understand that, in fact, there are seasons to some of these things. And the time that they taste best is when they're, in fact, coming out of the Mother Earth when Mother Earth planned on it, as opposed to being you know, made into a gaseous environment with grow lights on it. You know, virtually all of our agriculture is now being run like green pot used to be run out of you know, Northern California. You put everything in a dark hole with a lot of light on it, it'll grow as quickly as you need, and then you sell it. $200 an ounce used to be, now it's like twice as much as that, as far as I can tell. <laughs> and that's what they're doing with the little mescaloon and all these crazy greens that have absolutely no season and no reason to be on a plate in the middle of the winter. So, that, I mean, the, 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 the fundamental core of your product is something we want. We want local, farm-made, beautiful products that represent something similar to that in Italy, in Italy. And what we buy, and we don't try to import all the ingredients from Italy. The reason our food tastes Italian is the same reason that uh, the food in, in Venice doesn't taste like the food in Palermo. Because the people in Venice don't buy ingredients from Palermo. They don't like the idea of it. They use all their local ingredients because for an Italian, the thing that tastes best is the thing that smells like the wind on a Thursday afternoon within 10 minutes of where their mom had them. And if you can capture that smell, whether it's in the mid-Atlantic Hudson Valley or whether you're in Charleston or whether you're in Puglia or whether you're in Champaign, Illinois, capturing that regional flavor is the true method ideology that you really want to get to when you're cooking something that speaks more than just the recipe but of the passion of your interest in the flavor of the soil and geospecificity of the place you live in. So bring us your cheese. <laughs> yes. Um, so big fan. Thanks uh, for all the, the great years on Food Network. Um, so you brought up salt a second ago, and there's this kind of new trend for all different kinds of salt out there. 
what's your take on the pink Himalaya salt and the smoked salt and, you know, either just sea salt and kosher salt? It'd be really interesting to hear about that. For me, I use salt for three things. Hey, Mario, make him buy the app. He's going to buy the app. <laughs> of course he's going to buy the app. I didn't even uh, do the QR code yet. I'll, uh, I'll there you go. Right. <laughs> well, we need support on the app in this uh, manifestation because so far, I believe it's hard for people to shop for an app in, in the Google space right now because it's not organized in a way that you can just say, I want Mario Batali's app. You have to say Mario Batali or Mario Cooks. Or it's very specific to whatever the actual description is. So I'm sure your guys are working on that to make it easier to do. Because if there's any way to make money, this app business is knocking them out of the park. I mean, the, the guys who pre present them, the I company, as well as the G company, are going to make a lot of money on this if they can make it easier for the customer to get to the product. Salt is used for three things. <laughs> Salt is used as a preservative, as a flavor enhancer, and as a texture. As a preservative, I would use kosher salt. Like if I'm making salami or making something that I want to make like duck confit, or I want something to dry out if I want to make gravlax or cured salmon or anything like that, I use kosher salt because it's not expensive, its texture is not so sticky to my fingers, and the salinity is relatively benign. There are fine sea salts that are much saltier, and you use them in ways that you want to, but I'll get to the flavor thing in a world. The flavor component, what you're looking for is a salt that's softer, easier, or more intense, or more specifically relates to where the salt came from. There's the wet looking salt from France. They, the French have done a great job marketing salt that normally would have been a buck a pound and is now $15. They have this sell, sell de mer, sell de la Camargue, sell de whatever. And some of them are still even wet and we're still buying them, right? We're buying half processed salt. And that flavor component is something that matches the dish. If you want something to taste like it's from Puglia, you should buy Puglia olive oil, you should buy Puglia olives, Puglia spaghetti, Puglia tomatoes, and Puglia salt if you can. That said, what I use, and then there's the textual component, and there's the super uh, sale mare grosso from Sicily, there's the Malden sea salt, which is my personal favorite, and that's about the shaley texture and a slightly lower salinity on a finished dish. Like you cut a steak, you, you, you grill a perfect steak, you coat the heck out of it with salt, a little bit of pepper and olive oil, and you grill it until it's just charred beautifully and has a nice crust. Inside a steak like this, though, it's not salty on the inside. It's not, it's not seasoned. So we'll slice the steak and then we'll put a little more extra virgin olive oil and a little bit of this Malden salt on it. So you get this crunchy texture, a lower level of salinity, but a game that turns up that rare piece of meat in the center, or well done if you so like it. But it, what it does is it makes that whole chewing experience, that one bite captures everything that I want to say about the potential for beef's flavor. And it's because I salted and crusted it on the outside. I cooked it right, I let it rest, and then I finished it with a different kind of salt. And that's the understanding of salt. So I would say, you need a kosher salt, and that's also for your pasta water. You need a big, crunchy sea salt that you put in a salt grinder or a pepper grinder to put over things when you cook them. And then you need a crunchy, less salty salt to finish dishes, which is my favorite is the malt. Now, I go into it in much further detail. <laughs> <laughs> I'll check it out as soon as I can. Thanks. Beautiful. Yes, sir. Hi, thanks for coming in. My pleasure. Thanks for letting us try out your app. Um, I, I had uh, one question, one criticism about the app, if that's okay. Uh, the first question I had is the app has, I believe, 30 or 40 recipes in total? More? 65. 65. 65. Um, is there a plan to get more recipes in there in the future? Is that going to be an update, or are we going to have to buy more recipes? How is that going to work? You're going to have to buy more recipes. No, it's fair enough. <laughs> I just, is, is that plan? It's just like a cookbook. This is a small cookbook that, for five bucks, is a good deal. Uh, the next one, uh, their thought originally was to do uh, an in-store upgrade. But the problem with that is that the, if, say, you sell 150000 the only people that can buy the upgrade are the ones that have the 150000 The idea of selling a second one might be that I'll do the flavors of summer, or I'll do pastas for Easter, or I'll do a smaller one, and it will... In it will be a more specific need thing. Maybe somebody doesn't want 65 videos. Maybe they just want to know how to make the Feast of the Seven Fishes for Christmas Eve for next year. So it's and gonna be a separate, a separate It'll be app. a completely separate app. And that's a business decision. Okay. I, th I think it would be, personally, I think it'd be cooler if you could expand, if you could download another package that already works with this app. It's the same format. You're, you're already used to using it, but. But you understand that I would limit myself to the people that already bought it. Like there would be not one new customer. Because if you didn't buy the first one, you don't even know about the second one. Because it comes up in that first it. one. 
Well, I mean, if you market it, though, and you still have to buy the first one, some people might just say, you know what, I don't want the first one. Well, you buy the first one with the update. Right. But, all right. It, the, it's possible the, something could be put in. One, one kind of criticism I had is I was looking through the app, and I was looking at uh, pan con tomat, and uh -huh. um, I was looking at uh, the ingredients, and it said something like, what was it, six ounces of peeled tomato? I, I don't know how to measure that. Like, how many tomatoes are there? Is there a way? Well, they have this device called a scale. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And I know they're hard to find. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, I mean, you could put it in cups, but tomatoes don't really, I mean, like what you do when you go buy a tomato is you put it on the little scale there at the store and that'll tell you. Like that, once you have that, I, the reason I use measurement like that is because once people see what an eggplant weighs or what an onion weighs, it's always surprising that a, an onion might cost a dollar. You think an onion should almost be free. And then you realize an onion weighs like a, between a pound and a pound and a half. And you put it on there and it's 49 cents a pound, but it's already 75 cents when you weigh it. And understanding that is to start understanding food. And it's, it's seeing it in a different light. Although if it challenges you, I'm not happy about it because I'd rather have you just intuitively understand what we say. But we're kind of stuck using the, the measurements. It's cups or ounces. And ounces kind of throw people. You're right. It, it kind of throws people off. But you can't really measure a tomato in any other way. I mean, I can't put it, I could say this much. Wait, doesn't it come in a can? Right, you buy a canned tomato. Well, well no, tomatoes. But, but we're talking about fresh tomatoes, <laughs> I think. We want fresh tomatoes. If we're making pan con tomate, I'm grading it over like this. Oh, right? that's a bug. We got to fix that. All right. I'll take a look at that. Thank and you. Uh, the party on Thursday, where, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's at Del Posto, and Volkswagen's throwing it, and Gavin Rossdale from uh, Bush is playing live at Del Posto. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. What time does it start, Pam? Uh, She's not telling. <laughs> She's kind of squishy. I'll be there at 6.30, just for the record. <laughs> yes? Hi, um, I am out here for the week, and New York is awesome as far as restaurants go. Um, a food item I love that you have in your app is, I don't know if I'm saying it right, is brajol or bracciole. Bracciole. And, and I can't find it any, at any good Italian restaurant on the West Coast, so what could you recommend out here as opposed to get that? Well, there are, of course, my restaurants. Yes. <laughs> and, and that's pretty good about it. And but let, me, let me, without um, being shameless on that, I would say that if you're looking for the classic red sauce done in the most traditional New York style, you can walk through all of Little Italy and never find it. But if you spend 15 minutes on Arthur Avenue in the Bronx at a place like Mario's or Roberto's, if you haven't been there and you're only here for a couple of days, go out there as soon as you're done with work today. Go to Randazzo's, get a couple of clams on the half shell standing outside with a glass of cheap gavi, which hardly exists. And then go to any one of the seven, um, seven great Italian red sauce places within two blocks of Randazzo's and go to the Maronia Bakery and get the prosciutto bread. It will bring you to a place that they don't have anywhere else in America, and not so much in Italy anymore. And I know that we have bracciole on Thursdays at Lupa. So, I mean, you can okay. go there. But don't discount Arthur Avenue as one of the great things that we have here that we don't, that very rarely do Manhattaners and Brooklyners, the hipsters that I'm talking about. <laughs> I know where you're from, all right? I know where you all live. <laughs> we rarely go to the Bronx anymore unless we're going to Yankee Stadium. And to go to Arthur Avenue and see the real Italian-American tradition, alive and better than The Sopranos ever was, that's where I recommend you go. It is wild. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you again. Uh, my wife actually grew up in Italy. and. Uh, in five minutes, she can whip something up that takes people hours and tastes half as good. She does a lot of this. Count your lucky stars. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> She's a keep. Um, what's your view on improvisation? What's well, my view on improvisation? I mean, you have the recipes and, and sort of moving, switching little things here and there. She seems to have a knack for knowing uh, this is going to go well, this is not going to go well. How do you view all that? I completely love it. And in fact, the idea of taking a recipe to the grocery store and it says, all right, veal with mushrooms and escarole. And you go there, and the mushrooms, they don't look so good. But you buy them because you're feeling that you got to get it. And the escarole, well, it looks like it's three days old. But you buy it because you feel you got to get it. Once you become the master of a certain recipe, you, to, to, to move around within that recipe starts to become intuitive when you experiment a little bit at the house. I don't say experiment when you have 12 friends over and it's a big wine geek dinner at your house. But what you do do is you understand that a shiitake mushroom certainly works for a portobello mushroom, neither of which might be as good as a porcini mushroom, but at $38 a pound, porcini mushrooms might be a special occasion. So maybe just cr cremini mushrooms today. And mushrooms are obvious because that's the natural thing. But when you start to understand kind of the genus of the different kinds of 
things that you're using. Like any cruciferous vegetable will work if broccoli rob isn't there. And you could use broccoli, but you could also use cauliflower. You could also use the Romanesco. And understanding that they come in kind of groups is where you can start to experiment. And, and that's when you really become the master. Like you read a cookbook and you make these three recipes and they're all good. And understanding that if you're doing something braising like an osabuco and it's traditionally got carrots and onions and celery, that you could use celery root and put mushrooms in there as well or dried porcini. You start to think outside that box and that's when you start to become the master of your own destiny. And that's when cooking becomes something that instead of going with a recipe to the store, you go and you buy the five best things. Like that looks unbelievable today. And then you get home and you figure out what you're gonna make. It's less about the recipe and more understanding the steps of the technique. If it's just a saute and then some stuff goes in the pan and then you finish it with wine and finish the sauce, then it could be anything. Like, and, and you're only limited by your imagination and every now and then you have kind of a dud. But a, a dud isn't that bad because I mean you made it anyway. The, the real component here is these. The, the human touch, the actual nature of something being handmade is what distinguishes it from the rest of the people's food. And if we can get our hands on it, or get someone that we like, or even love, or don't even really care for, but appreciate their technique, if we can get their hands on our stuff, then that handmade component is what really transforms something from being pretty good to really exceptional. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Hi, my name is Dahlia. Thank you for coming in. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but the goal of your app is to provide original information to users in a unique way and to engage them. Um, how has the response been, and uh, do you think you're achieving that goal? Um, I, I don't, I, I, original is an odd thing when you're talking about a cuisine that's 3,000 years old. It's kind of my take on a lot of the dishes. It's certainly, my take is slightly original, but not so much. I'm much more of an adherent to the tradition world than the experimentation or for lack of a better word, the molecular gastronomy world. So the content is kind of my take on traditional stuff. But it's, uh, I think it's being successful in that people are cooking more. I think when people walk into Italy, they say the same thing. I want to eat something. But what we want them to understand is, yes, come in and eat something, but eat something in support of understanding that you can make this at your house. And I think that people are starting to use it. Certainly, the larger you can see it, the more you feel like I'm in your kitchen. I haven't had very many complaints, but again, I don't read complaint mail very often. You can look at the reviews on that other store. OK, so They're the reviews are good. People love the app. Great. So Thank I guess we're good. I just want to chime in with one other thing about that other, your question. You know, it was a choice to Mario. How, how many recipes do you have in your device? Like 800,000 or something? No, like 120,000. <laughs> no, but literally has thousands. And um, in terms of making this app, you know, we discussed doing something that wouldn't have the video content and the images, but it seemed like you kind of want to put this guy in your device, you know, and not just have a bunch of text. So that's why there are 63 recipes and not 800. Like Mark Bittman. Right. Whose book is brilliant, but he doesn't really show you how to do it like I show you how to do it. So if there's ever a question on technique, not that ours is that complicated, but this should remove any doubt if there's ever a question on how far it brown is brown or how deep, dark, golden brown something needs to get before you turn it over, before you braise, or how to deal with pesto, or whatever. Like, it's very visual, it's very obvious, it's very clear, I think, I hope. Thank you. Sure. So, Mario, can we just take those last four questions? Sure, that, sure. That, okay, so we'll cut it off after the fourth. All right. Um, <clears throat> so I was introduced to Otto in my uh, first week in New York, seven years ago, and I still go regularly. And over the years, I got a few questions. So, um, first, can you, Tell us something about the, the pizza recipe there because it looks kind of unique. At Otto? Yeah. Um, I decided that I wanted to put a restaurant in 1 Fifth Avenue, which is very near my house, directly across the street. <coughs> I love uh, the building. I love the look of it. I love the location. And I love the fact that it was very much featured in Ghostbusters, if you remember when the <laughs> Stay Puft Marshmallow Man was coming down the path to crush Bill Murray. Although the large shot showed him on uh, Central Park, it's in fact in that building. So I was very excited about that. <laughs> the problem with that building is that there is no gas lines. There is no open flame. It is all electric. So we had to create a pizza recipe that would work on a flat top griddle and then under a broiler. So we did, which has a slightly, uh, a little bit more yeast, a lot less manipulation with it. And it's relatively crisp and not so elastic like some of the Neapolitan pizzas that are enjoying fame right now. 
Uh, I think it's a delicious pizza. It is, in Italy, every different region has its own different kind of pizza. The pizza in the rage right now is the Neapolitan, which is considered the mother of all pizzas. And it's got a little bit more pull to it. It's very light. It has this kind of spongy, not so crisp top. And a lot of it's very wet in the center. I like it a little less wet in the center. So we put less stuff on it. But I think the fundamental similarities that we share with all good pizza is that there's not too much stuff on it ever. And it's really about the balance between the dough and the condiment, which is very much like in pasta. And my other question is a, <coughs> sorry. I tried all your other Italian restaurants, uh, and the Spanish ones, and um, it seems like you, you, um, you have the range of like, very expensive ones, and the less expensive ones, and then there's Otto. It's, it's really cheap. Um, cheap so, is a bad word. Inexpensive. Uh, um, for, for, yeah, in a, in a very good way. Right. <clears throat> so I often sit there and eat pasta alla norma or something, and I wonder, how can you actually sell it for $9? It's cheaper than... <laughs> really bad pastas I ate elsewhere, <laughs> and it's great. And <clears throat> like, do you lose money when I, <laughs> when I eat there? I appreciate your concern, thank you. <laughs> and one day we're gonna turn a profit there, <laughs> as long as you stop ordering so much of the pasta alla norma. <laughs> no, what, 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 our trademark, particularly in our less expensive restaurants, is to make it even a little bit more like real food in Italy. And when you eat really great food in Italy, often enough, what surprises you, even though maybe you're not so cognizant of it, what surprises you is the lack of white noise. There's, when you order spaghetti with peas and prosciutto in Italy, it's literally only spaghetti with peas and prosciutto. Like the prosciutto's the fat, the peas are in it, maybe a dusting of Parmigiano Reggiano. But what the fundamental difference is, is there's not a lot of extra chef ego on there. And in that same sense, when you eat pasta alla norma there, it's basic tomato sauce, it's the eggplant that we baked in the oven, and then a little bit of that creamy ricotta over the top. There's not a lot of other stuff. So it's easy for me to make. It's inexpensive because I'm not adding all of this ornate technical components, which means I need a lot more hands to cook it. And then people eat it, and, they, or, and it's not like a giant portion. Like Americans have come to expect that the one pound bag is a unique serving size. <laughs> and, and, and in Italy, between 70 and 90 grams is the normal size of a portion. So you get six portions out of one bag of spaghetti because they expected to eat something else, whether it's just a salad or two slices of prosciutto or a small main course. So you're getting the right portion. And, what you're doing is because it's nine, you're having another couple of things so that maybe you get to $20 or $15 or wherever the normal is. But you can find a satisfying experience on that. So thank you. And thanks for coming. And thanks for your concern. Otto is my most profitable restaurant. <laughs> because we sell a lot of wine, too. I mean, you know, the whole experience is a very fair deal. And it works out really well. But I mean, also keep in mind, profits based on volume. And Otto, this last Saturday, did 1,273 people. Whoa. <laughs> any chance of any cheaper restaurant, any more less, less expensive? expensive restaurant which you will make more money on? <laughs> I'm always working on them. Have you been to Italy yet? I tried. Go on it. <laughs> Just go on and don't go on a Saturday. And don't go when there's a velvet rope and some guy talking into his wrist in the afternoon. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I, I opened up this great thing that I was so excited about. And basically, I walk into my building, and I get in the elevator, and a guy looks at me and says, nice line, asshole. <laughs> 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 what? What? He said, yeah, there's a line 300 people long to get in your fucking grocery store, asshole. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Thank you. Hi, Mario. My name is Frederick. I, um, I would like to talk a little bit about Italy. And um, I, I think it was the opening was the 31st of August. And I know the concept from Europe. And I know you briefly talked about the beginning. But do you think this is a, like a sustainable business, like sort of a melting pot for, for Itali Italian culture and so on? My own experience was I obviously love the variety of products and foods. It felt here and there a little bit like a supreme McDonald's don't, in terms of efficiency and so on. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, the coffee is, uh, is, I didn't find it particular good, but I, li I like the place in terms of... Uh, in Did you drink your coffee at the Lavazza bar or the Vignano? The, in the very, at the entrance, and that feels like a Starbucks. Uh, yeah, it does. More than anything Come else. in another 30 feet, and there's a big silver machine, and all they sell is espresso and espresso macchiato. There are no milk drinks. Yeah. There is no other things other than those two things, and it's two and a quarter. Go in and have that coffee, and I assure you, your coffee faith will be restored. The re as for the rest, efficiency is what Americans bring to the table. 
the passion and the excitement and the product are what the Italians bring to the table. It's definitely sustainable. Last Saturday, 14,700 people went grocery shopping there, which is a number that I have no idea how it happens. But what it is, unfortunately, like any great thing in New York, it's overcrowded during peak hours, and it's just right during non-peak hours. So the best way to understand a place like that is to go at 9.30 at night, or go at 10 o'clock in the morning on the weekends. But on Saturday and Sunday between like 1 and 8, it is... It's like a Beatles concert. It's crazy. So, so I guess this has been a success then so far. Do you think um, they're going to expand it to other cities as well? Yes. There? And uh, we're, we're, we love the expansion idea. Uh, I am a partner in Italy in North, Central, and South America. I would say probably our next location will be Toronto. And probably our third location will be Mexico City. And then I'll try to find one in America. You need the sophisticated clientele that you get in an inner city as well as uh, the resulting high rolling suburbs, but they need to be, they need to, it can't feel uh, like it's gonna be in Pasadena. It can't, to me, look like it's in a mall. It needs to be in a place that kind of in, embodies the, 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 like we're in the toy building in Manhattan, which is a beautiful building right across from the Flatiron. And it needs to feel a part of that vibrant part of that live city culture. It wouldn't feel good in, in Culver City in Los Angeles. It wouldn't feel good outside of Chicago. We'd have to be down in, in the middle of town. So the real issue is finding that kind of real estate. This is 50,000 square feet in a place that makes sense. So we're looking into it, but Toronto's like a home run. It's easy. We can get downtown location. It's the largest popular population of Italian North Americans outside of New York and a great place to be. So that's where we're going. Thank you. Thanks. Vergnano, Cafe Vergnano. <laughs> yes. Hi. Hi. Um, sure. Um, so I wanted to just ask, like, you, you deliver very um, traditional Italian dishes to sort of the American market. Do you find that sometimes you have to compromise uh, on certain things to suit the American palate? So say, like, if you go to Rome and you, you get a pasta and it, it's very al dente, there's like maybe two, three ingredients in it, um, it's not very heavily seasoned, do you find that dishes like that maybe aren't so popular here and you don't try and sell them or do you try and adjust it to suit a palate? Like how do you struggle between staying very traditional and sort of, you know, suiting to the American taste? That's a very good question. I would say that the one compromise that we might make would be that there's probably 10% more sauce on our pastas here than there would be in Italy. Anywhere, anywhere in Italy. And that's because they look at the, do the dish as the noodle and the condiment or the sauce as like salad dressing. Like the idea of having extra dressing at the bottom of a salad is repugnant to all of us. The idea of having a little extra sauce to drag up with our bread is kind of what the Americans feel the right is. It's rare that we'll send out, if someone says, can I have extra sauce, we have to actually say no. But we put a little bit more on just to kind of stem that tide. Uh, al dente is a concept that Americans only think about. Um, <laughs> many of them love saying it, and many of them actually like to say al dente. <laughs> Dante was a Tuscan poet from the 1400s. If we had anything, Al Dante would certainly be rather disgusting and buried, so. Al dente in Italy is one thing. It is almost crunchy, and Americans just don't love it, and the Italians absolutely do. So when we recognize the low tip potential of a six top of Italians, we definitely undercook their pasta to the level that we think they want. If Americans say al dente, I mean, we serve it in the realm. But if you want to, if, if, if someone says they want it like Italy, we will make it literally 30 seconds less in the water. Okay, so we can actually request that. Oh, absolutely. Your restaurant. See, I want it like Italy, just like Mario says. And, and <laughs> if you go to Italy, that's the only way we serve it. And we piss off 20 customers a day. <laughs> but if they want it more cooked, we just put it back in the pan, no problem. Okay. Thanks. So ask for it Italian al dente. Fantastic, thanks. Sure. Yes. That was the last question. Thank you again for oh, coming. Oh, great. Um, I think that you know, you're most well known for your Italian dishes and your Italian cooking, and most of the conversation today has been about Italian cooking, but you also have this little place called Casamono, which I think is one of my favorite restaurants. It's fantastic. And now that you've opened Italy and we have the perfect place to go buy all of our Italian products, where can I go buy, buy my Spanish products, or where should I go? Despagna on Broom has just about everything you'd ever need. Also, latienda.com is where they get all their stuff. So when you want to buy Morcilla and you don't want to pay their markup, La Tienda delivers overnight just like everyone else does. The real winners in the, in the internet trade business are the customers and UPS and FedEx. 
So as long as we understand that, then it's great, because we can get products delivered. I mean, let's put it this way. If you go on peck.it, IT, and you want to get a Coolatello, which is illegal to bring in, and you tell them to market with a book label on the outside, they will ship that to your house, and no one will stop it. <laughs> so there's a thousand ways to get around the pesky rules of the USDA. <laughs> but that said, <laughs> that said, the Spanish products, outside of the really hoof on uh, uh, Ibérico, we can get just about everything, because the Spanish guys kind of paid attention a little bit more quickly and didn't kind of isolate some of their products. So go to Despaña on Broom and maybe Green La or Mercer. Fayette. Lafayette, great store. And they had tortilla española perfectly made, almost <laughs> as good as the one we make at Bar Hamon. Perfect, and I was one of only 10 people in Italy almost locked in there for the night on Sunday, so I had a totally <laughs> different experience. You got the luck of being locked I in did. there? Almost. You know, people will pay for that. I know. <laughs> well, thank you. So I'll, um, in appreciation, um, our commitment as a team, right, has got to be to download enough of these apps to get it to number one on the Android store, so we stop hearing about the other people and how they do a better job of promoting. So help me out with that, folks. Um, Mario, anything you wanted to say about the app before, anything else before we, before we wrap? Um, I think the funnest part about it is if you like me, you can have me <laughs> in your kitchen. If you don't, you shouldn't download the app, I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's me doing what I do and what I enjoy in a very relaxed setting, very much like this. And it feels like this. It's, you don't necessarily get my witty response and repartee, but you do get the answers to your questions. And if you say, I say, and then you zest a lemon, and you say, I don't know how to zest a lemon, or I don't know how to trim an artichoke, or I don't know how to uh, make a ragu, or whatever, you can go to the video that will give you that information with the support. And that's what this is about. This is not the vol most voluminous, recipe-heavy app on the market, but it is the one with the most clear, most distinct, most personal presentation of my take on what this food can and should be. And that's why you would buy this app. Yes? One quick question. What do you think about the Barney's windows when you're <laughs> <laughs> What do I think about Barney's windows? Um, if you haven't seen them, there's this crazy guy named Simon Doonan, who's a visionary, whose job it is is to draw the eyes of the world to Barney's Christmas windows so that you'll go there. I was the sacrificial animal in the middle of this table. And there's something with a neck of mine about this big, and then a tiny necklace of miniature orange crocs all around me. And in the middle of my mouth is an apple or something red and large. Wow. I'm flat, like, like reading heat. It's um, flattering to be a part of it. It's not that beautiful to enjoy myself. But that said, it's iconically clear where their caricature is going. And I'm just proud to be in the game. So I'm, I'm all right with it. It's funny. The one in Vegas is even weirder. You got to see it. It's pretty strange. <laughs> but that said, it's fascinating and fun. And the pop culture component of our business is, is wild. And it's amazing how many people pay attention to it and see it and know about it, even from a perspective of someone who doesn't shop at Barney's or even go to 61st Street very often, of which I fit into both of those categories. But that said, it's kind of cool. And Simon Doonan is wacky. I mean, you know, it's like being a Disney cartoon. He's wacky. I love it. So I wanted to say, when I kicked this off, I said I didn't think he'd disappoint, and I, I think that was absolutely right. And Mario, I just have to say, the personality is a whole lot more colorful than the hair and shoes put together. So thank you very, very much for joining us today. It was a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you.